All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a uh, overview of bivariate data stuff from our unit. It is my goal to say all this stuff in under 10 minutes. If you want a further explanation on how to do any of these things, you can go to the different modules on Canvas and look at those assignments, watch the videos again. I'm just kind of doing a general overview here so you can hear it again uh, verbally. Uh, and then kind of see things uh, visually as well. I'm not going to be doing all of these problems, but I'm going to kind of explain quickly how they go. So a quick overview of everything by very stats. Uh, so first thing you will do is get be able to make a scatter plot. And the way scatter plots work is typically you'll have a, a table of some sort, just a list of data, uh, and the the data comes into variables, which is why it's called by variate data, and these make uh, points. This is the point 8, comma 83. So you go to 8 and approximately 83 and you put a dot, you know, and then you go to 7, 86. So you go 7, 86 is a little bit above 85, and you put dots and you, you put all these dots and it, you have some sort of scatter plot. Uh, and that's a scatter plot. Uh, scatter plots can, can show you whether the two variables have some sort of correlation between them. Uh, a correlation is do the dots follow some sort of pattern? If they're going up as you go from left to right, that's called a positive correlation. Uh, if they're going down as you go left to right, that's called a negative correlation. Uh, and if there's not a distinct pattern, that's called no correlation. Uh, and the more together the dots are along that, that pattern that they're showing, the stronger it is. So these two here would be strong, uh, this one would be weaker, and this one would be even weaker. Uh, as, it, as far as correlations go. Uh, you also need to be able to tell whether two different variables, you know, in real life, you know, that thing outside your house or that thing inside your house, uh, it, those can have correlations, right? One variable can be going up and another variable can be going up or down based on that. Uh, like the number of hours someone has driven and the number of miles they've driven. That's going to be a positive correlation. This goes up this also goes up. Uh, the number of siblings someone has and the grade they have in math class, you know, this mm, probably doesn't have a very strong correlation. Uh, if you have more siblings, is your grade in math class going to go up or down? It's kind of a kind of a question mark, right? Some people might say if there's a lot of people in the house, especially now, you know, your grade might be going down. Uh, but if you're going to school like normal, this is probably a lot less likely that your siblings are affecting your, your grade in, in math. The age of car and the value of a car. You know, as a, as cars get older, their value tends to go down. I know there's some collector's items, but those are the exception. Most cars get become worth less and less and less. They get driven more and more and more, and they break down, and they finally stop working. And at that point, they're only worth the scrap metal that they have in them, right? Their value goes down pretty quickly. Right? The number of CDs has... The number of weeks a CD has been out and the total sales, uh, you can replace this with like album or movie or whatever, right? Usually when uh, some sort of media comes out, the sales are really high at the beginning. Uh, so uh, as the weeks go on, your your sales start going down. They're really high at the beginning and they start going down. So that'd be a negative correlation. Uh, this would be negative. Uh, this would be no correlation. This would be positive. Uh, number of years a person went to school and their income, generally, generally, the more years people go to school, the higher their income, uh, because, you know, they have more expertise, so that'd be a positive correlation. Uh, number of songs downloaded on your iPod, oh, I love how dated this is, uh, and the amount of memory available, uh, I don't know if you guys ever had to, like, download a lot of things before, but usually the amount you download... Uh, leaves you with less memory, so this would be a, a negative correlation. Uh, other things that you'll be able to do is get line of best fit and correlation coefficient. Uh, you can use your calculator if you have a graphing calculator in hand, uh, but there's also the online calculator, and you need to be aware of how to use it. Um, you need to go in here and enter your X and Y data uh, here in your lovely table. And it'll spit out your R value. This is correlation coefficient. Coefficient. Uh, and then the M is the slope of the line. 
and then the B is the Y intercept of your line. Uh, and you do need to know how to round to the second decimal place. So something like this would be Y equals 0 0.14 X, because 135 makes it round up. And this would be 0 0.21 on the end there. So point plus 0 0.21. All right. So you need to be able to read this and, and write out your... Uh, line of best fit, write out your correlation coefficient, which is going to be 0 0.76, something like that. Uh, be aware, this is not the data that's that's in the table there. I just wanted to kind of show you the online calculator again. Uh, you also need to be able to say whether the correlation is positive, negative, and moderate, strong, weak, based off the correlation coefficient, uh, which uh, I happen to have found like kind of a, a rule of thumb little table to help you know kind of what strong, moderate, weak correlations are like. Um, and something that really helps in remembering about correlation coefficient is it always goes between negative 1 and positive 1, right? Your, your R is always between those values. Uh, and the closer to 0 you get, the weaker it is. You can almost think of this as like percent, right? 0. 0.8 is like 80%. You know, that's when you start having a B. Uh, and that's a strong, right? You get 0. 0.8, 0. 0.9, that's B, A kind of values. Are, that's, that's strong, that's good grades, right? If you go between 0.5 and 0.8, you're looking at more moderate. Uh, the closer and closer you get to 0.5 and 0.3, you're getting weaker and weaker and weaker. So it's a continuum. It's not like as soon as you hit 0.5, it's now weak, or as soon as you hit 0.3, it's now no correlation. But it's on a scale, uh, and you can kind of think of it as percent. And that kind of will let you know whether it's weak, strong, uh, moderate, uh, you remember, these are kind of like C's and D's here, uh, which are, you know, they're, they're okay grades, but, you know, as soon as you get below 50%, you're looking at like F grades, and those tend to be really bad. Uh, and so, you know, be able to read your correlation coefficient, something like this, 0.76. That's, you know, moderately strong. You know, it's, it's, it's in this section, but it's really close to 0.8. So, you know, moderately strong. Uh, you also need to... Uh, be able to say what that says about the data. Uh, if you have a correlation, say, of 0.63 about this, uh, the length of some sand sharks and their weight, uh, well, that's, you know, it's a moderate correlation coefficient, kind of weak. Uh, and that'll let you know that the length of the sand shark is moderately correlated with the weight of the sand shark. So, you know, generally, as the shark gets longer, it weighs more uh, is kind of the correlation there though it's not a rule that doesn't mean a, a longer shark has to be has to weigh more um, yeah so it gives you there you do need to recognize the difference between correlation and causation which we'll get there in a sec um, you need to be able to make a prediction using a line of best fit so let's say you had this line of best fit you had to get the amount spent on groceries given some number of children well, let's say they had seven children. You need to know if this is X or Y. Uh, and this one's going to be an X value, right? Number of children. So you got to take this seven and put it in your equation there and, and be able to put that in your calculator, right? 21.08 times seven. Uh, and then plus, plus 85.50. And you put that calculator in calculator and get the amount spent on groceries, approximate. Uh, you also need to be able to say what the slope and y-intercepts mean in the context of the problem. You need to be able to say what the independent and dependent variables are. Uh, you need to remember that x uh, tends to be the independent. Independent. <laughs> I think I can write legibly. Uh, and then the y's tend to be the dependent variable. And the idea behind that is depend, dependent. Uh, is the amount you spend on your groceries depends on how many children are in the household. Uh, not that the other way around, right? The If someone's spending more money on food, it's not like children just start coming into their house. Uh, that's not generally how that works. Uh, and so you need to know the difference between independent and dependent. Independent, like the good old US of A, don't care about nothing, uh, what other people say. Whereas the dependent one, you know, relies on the independent thing to, to change, and then it will change. Uh, on this one, slope and y-intercepts mean in the context, uh, your slope here, 21.08, is letting you know that the groceries is going to go up about $21.08 for every child. So go up 1 in x, how much does the y go up? 
and then the y-intercept here, this is the y-value when x is 0. Uh, and so you look at when x is 0, that'd be 0 children. And it's the y-value, the amount spent on groceries. So you, you'd spend $85.15 if there were no children. That'd be what the y-intercept means. Uh, just a couple other things to remember. Uh, sometimes you get a line of best fit uh, to model data that is not linear. And we would say that is not a good model for the data. Uh, you can still make a prediction, right? You can plug in 108 in here and get a prediction. I'm oh, sorry, you can get throw in 1,000 in here and get a prediction of a growth rate of 108. Uh, that'd be like way over here. But uh, is that a reasonable prediction? Um, no, like definitely not. Fish are not going to be growing at any sort of rate. Um, because at a thousand degrees, uh, the water is not liquid anymore. You know, it's it's a it's a gas. Uh, it might be a plasma. I'm not quite sure what what temperature things start going crazy. But the fish would like n be gone. You know, they'd be consumed in the flames at that point. So they're not really reproducing. It's a really bad prediction. Uh, this is called an extrapolation. Uh, I did not write enough space for me to write that. But yeah, that that's an extrapolation. Um, it's way outside the data, way unreasonable, um, so, so keep that in mind. And then visually, uh, the data goes like this, you know, it has a nice uh, upside down U shape or an N shape there, and your line just kind of cuts through the middle. That is not a good fit for the data. Um, you also need to be able to tell the difference uh, between correlation and causation. Correlation means they follow a similar pattern. Causation means one variable is causing the other thing to happen. So let's say we have a situation here, you know, in the amount of sunlight we get in, U in Utah uh, versus the physical video game sales in the UK. Um, well, how much sun we're getting in Utah is not going to cause more sales in the UK of video games, right? That is a, a wrong conclusion. Though these do have a very, these have a strong correlation. 0.89 is a strong correlation. Uh, they follow a similar pattern, meaning they're growing in a similar way, but that doesn't mean one is causing the other. You need to know that. Uh, and the last thing we went over were residuals, and residuals are made uh, when you take the points on, uh, you take these points and figure out how far they are from your line of best fit. Uh, and it makes a little of the graphs. And the thing to note is you want random, well, kind of smattering of residuals. That's good. If you have a pattern uh, like these here, uh, these are bad. That lets you know it's a, it's a bad fit for the data. Um, this, is, this would mean it's a good fit for the data. So uh, having a pattern of residuals is bad for the model. The model's not a good match for the data. Whereas if the residuals are more random, that means the model or your line of best fits a good match for the data. Uh, I didn't do this in under 10 minutes. Sorry, a little, thir a little over 13, but hopefully that was helpful to you somewhat.